baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. In the center lesson this morning of a series, a uh, five-part series on the Ten Commandments, and uh, this morning we're going to deal with commandment number three, a uh, very important commandment and one that's, that's very misunderstood. Uh, but in general, as we've been studying the last couple of weeks, uh, people tend to misunderstand the whole purpose of the Ten Commandments anyway. And so we've named this series the Ten Commitments because really that's what these things are. It's ironic to me that most people in this world, including Christians, including us, we tend to view God through the lens of the law. Uh, we view God as this austere, angry, judgmental person in heaven. And we view ourselves, of course, as very fallible and, and human and full of faults and failures. And so there's this discrepancy between God who is holy and those of us who, who know we're unholy. And and we almost look at God's laws sometimes as Him looking at us saying, you better measure up. And if you don't measure up, you're in trouble when you get to heaven. Some people even view God this way. It's kind of like, well, when I die, God will put me on the balance. And if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, then you know I'll probably make it in. And if you ask most people, uh, how do you know you're going to heaven? Even Christian people, even Pentecostals, uh, a lot of times what you'll find is that they start talking about their behavior almost instantly. Well, I'm as good as so-and-so, or I keep the commandments of God, or I try to live a holy or a righteous life. Or They'll give you something that relates to their behavior. And that's really ironic, because if there's any one thing that God has made crystal clear in Scripture, it's that your behavior, and my behavior can never merit us a place in heaven. You can live holy, you can live righteous, you can live godly, you can live every commandment in the Word of God for all of your life. And if you do that outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ, all you've done is you've been a good person for sure, but you haven't merited a place in heaven. How many know that we don't get to heaven on our own goodness? We get to heaven through the goodness and the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ in our lives. And so, a really important principle. It's ironic that when God has made that so crystal clear, your behavior can't merit you a place in heaven. It's ironic that most people still view God through the lens of the law, trying to find acceptance with God through how they act. And, uh, you know, you've got to learn this principle early on in your Christian life. We don't do good things so we can get saved. We do good things because we are saved. And if you go all the way back to the Ten Commandments, which is probably where this idea got started, uh, you'll find that the Ten Commandments were not given to a people... Uh, on Israel so that they could measure up and God could find them uh, righteous and then he'd fellowship with them. These commandments were given to a people that God already had a relationship with. God had a relationship with Israel from the night that he delivered them out of Egyptian bondage. They put the blood on the doorposts of their house in obedience to the word and the will of God. They walked through the waters of the Red Sea in obedience to the word and the will of God. And they followed the pillar of cloud and fire through the desert in obedience to the will and the word of God. They already had a relationship with God. And three months later, they go to Mount Sinai and Moses walks up to the top of the mountain. And then and only then does God give them the law. So they're not at Mount Sinai hoping to get in. They're already in. They're not at Mount Sinai hoping to get a relationship with God. They already have a relationship with God. They're already His people. And if God ever gives you a command, if God ever gives you a rule to live by, if God ever privileges you by opening up His Word to your understanding and you think, wow, there's something that God wants me to do. If God ever privileges you with that kind of knowledge, that's not because He's measuring you. That's because you're His child and He wants to protect you and guide you just like you give rules to your kids. You don't give rules to everybody else's kids on the street. You give rules to the kids that you love and that you care about because you have a vested interest in how they turn out. And so, if you think about Israel, uh, these people have been in slavery for 400 plus years. 430 years. And they're brought out of bondage on that one night that they still call Passover. 
It's on that night that God sets them free. They are delivered. It's the exodus, the coming out, the exiting out of Egypt. It's the Passover. God passed over them. He didn't judge them. He set them free. And so the law is not given to a people in slavery. They were in slavery for 430 years, but God set them free from slavery. So the laws are not given to people enslaved. We've got countries that are in the news right now around the world. We're trying to get foreign aid into these countries that have been devastated. And we can't get it there freely. Why? Because those people are not free to receive foreign aid. We have to work through governments that oppress them. Those people don't have laws like we have in this country because they are governed by dictators and they live in fear. That was Israel for 430 years. The laws of God were not given to keep a bound people bound. They were given to keep a free people free. And if you ever understand that, it will revolutionize your understanding of the Word of God. This book is not given to keep us in bondage or to let us not have the freedoms that everybody else has. This book is given to to a free people to keep them free. This book will keep you from sin. This book will keep you from addiction. This book will keep you from bondage. This book will keep you from making the fatal mistakes that so many people make if you pay attention to God's commands. And that's that's why we call this the Ten Commitments. Not the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commitments. God's rules are not a condition of relationship. God's rules are a confirmation that you already have a relationship. Because rules never establish a relationship with anybody. You can't legislate a relationship. You either have one or you don't have one. You can't force a relationship. Rules without a relationship in there, they always breed rebellion. And you will rebel against the things that are very best for you, the things that God ordains for your life. You will rebel against them unless you have a relationship with God. You'll think they're stupid. You'll think they're irrelevant. You'll think they don't relate to modern society. You will always rebel against the rules and the principles of God unless you have a relationship with God. And so so the real point here is relationship. Now, we, in the last two weeks, we talked about two commandments. First commandment, we, we all know, it's thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, if I could bring that commandment into 2008 and say it in a way that relates to us, what God is saying is, don't go to multiple gods for multiple needs. Don't have this area over here where you go there for this kind of fulfillment, and this God over here you go to this kind of fulfillment, and and, and you go to all these different places and all these different people and all these different situations to meet your needs. Come to me because I can meet every need. Let me be the center of your everyday life. Don't have any other other gods before me. And and when you break it down like that, it makes sense. God is saying, I'm the one that set you free. I'm the one that got you ready for heaven. I'm the one that gave you this relationship. So I want to be the center of your life. And we say, yes, that's a commitment, not a commandment. And then the second command is don't make any graven images. Or today we would say, don't make any idols. And our idols in North America are not little statues that we bow down before. We bow down before ideas. We bow down before what Hollywood tries to sell us. We bow down before what the financial situations and the financial markets try to sell us. We bow down to peer pressure. We bow down to all kinds of things in our culture. They're not statues. They're ideas. And North Americans are probably more idolatrous than any other group of people on the face of the earth. We're more idolatrous than somebody in the jungles of Africa that's never heard of God bowing down before a little statue that to them represents God. What is a God in your life? A God is what you organize your life around. You can tell what your God is by how you spend your money and how you spend your time. And if you just look at your day timer and your pocketbook, you'll know exactly what's the center of your life. And God says, if anything else is the center of your life, it's not me at the center. And so he says, don't make any graven images. What he's literally saying is, don't form anything with your hands that replaces me or even represents me. And and we talked about this last week. What they would do in Bible times is they would make an idol and they would set it up somewhere in a temple or in a grove or on a hilltop. And they would go to that idol and they would worship that idol. Now, what that meant was they had made their God a location. 
And so when your God is in a certain location, here's the point, you can get away from your God. You can leave your God at the temple or at the church or where the other godly people worship, and you can for the rest of the week go about your business because your God is a location. Your God is an idol. Your God has been shrunk down to a manageable component of your life. And so you can go anywhere else, do anything else, and then once a week or twice a week or three times a week, you come back into the presence or into the location of your God. And don't think that we don't do that because we do in North America. Churches by the thousands in North America are really almost like idol worship centers. It's where we go to have that one day a week religion with God. And God already told us, if I'm not the center of your everyday life, you can just go do it yourself because I'm not willing to be made into a manageable little piece of your life. I either want to be Lord or you just go do it yourself. The Ten Commandments, if you read back through that commandment, God says, for I, the Lord your God, I'm a jealous God. I won't let you put anything else in the mix. Why? Because I created you and I know what's best for you. Any parents here? You ever tell your kids, because I said so? At that point, with their maturity level, you know that to get into a debate with them on the pros and cons of whatever it is that they want to embark on as a direction in life, you know that at that maturity level, it's pointless to go through the ABCs and a three-page essay on why they shouldn't. So finally, you just say, because I said so, that's why. And sometimes God almost does that to us. He says, here's my commands. You live by them and you'll be blessed. And if you ignore them, you do so at your peril. And that's what God says in those commandments. Now, those aren't really commandments. Those are commitments to God. First of all, we make a commitment but that there's no other God but Him. And secondly, we make a commitment that we will not make anything, will not fashion anything, will not put an idol up at the center of our life and go worship that. We will actually just have God and God alone. And those aren't really commandments. Those are commitments that we make with God because He set us free. Look around this church or any church that worships the one true living God. And here's what you'll find. You won't find a bunch of people that got pressured into a religion. You'll find a bunch of people that are grateful that God stepped into their sin-darkened life and He brought them out of their sin. He brought them out of their addiction. They have their own little exodus story. I was in bondage. I was a slave. I was in darkness. I didn't get it. But then one day, I found the one true living God and He brought me out. And when he brought me out, I was so grateful that that's why I'm here today. That's what you find. Nobody makes uh, drastic life changes because somebody else pressures them into that. We make life changes because we want to. And there's no more critical life change that you need to make than to put God at the center of your life. So, so that brings us to commandment number three. If you've got your Bible, Exodus 20, verse 7. Now, this commandment is misunderstood. Uh, probably your parents misunderstood this commandment, and that's why you misunderstand it. It says this, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Now, that commandment, I don't know how your folks interpret it to you and how their parents interpreted it to them, But here's what I want to tell you right up front about that commandment. That commandment is not about swearing. Everyone say, it's not about swearing. Now, make sure you follow that with this P.S. Turn to the same person and say, but you still shouldn't swear. There are lots of commands in the Bible about not swearing. This is not one of them. There are lots of commandments about not using the Lord's name as a curse. But this is not one of them. This is talking about something entirely different. In fact, it's talking about something a little bit more difficult than that. Um, the topic of swearing or, or whatever you want to call that, that's not, talking, uh, that's not this, the topic of this passage. The Jews took this commandment so literally that they wouldn't even, by the time of Jesus, hundreds of years after the Ten Commandments, they wouldn't even pronounce some of the names of God. Because they were scared that they would uh, use the name of the Lord in vain. Kind of like a swear word. So they wouldn't even pronounce some of the names of God. And Jesus really messed that up because uh, the name that they wouldn't pronounce most of all was called the Tetragrammaton. It was four letters, no consonants, all, or no vowels, all consonants. 
and it was called the ineffable name of God, or we would say the unpronounceable name of God. And so uh, they, they took those consonants, they put some vowels in it uh, so that the priests could pronounce it, and uh, they would call it Yahweh. We would say Jehovah. That was the name of God in the Old Testament. But by the time of Jesus, they wouldn't even say that name. They were so terrified of breaking this commandment. And then Jesus comes along and he, he goes around the, the street saying, I am. You, you read it in the Gospels, but we miss it because of the English. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the door. I am the vine. I am the shepherd. Every time he says, I am, that's not a pronoun and a verb like we think it is in English. That's actually Jesus using the unutterable, un- ineffable, holy name of God from the Old Testament when God said to Moses on the same mountain, I am that I am. They hadn't pronounced that name for hundreds of years because they were afraid of breaking this commandment. And all of a sudden, a carpenter from Galilee is walking around their streets in a pair of sandals and a robe with his disciples, and he's using that holy name of God in reference to himself all the time. I am the door. I am the way, the truth, and the life. They look at him at his trial and say, are you the Son of God? And he looks back at them and he uses that name. I am. And you'll see the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven. They crucified him for that. They knew exactly what Jesus was doing. Every time he used what we would say in English is a a pronoun and a verb, I am, he was using that holy name of God. In reference to himself, they knew exactly what he was saying. Jesus wasn't claiming to be part of God. He wasn't claiming to be a junior God. He wasn't claiming to be part of a committee of gods. He was claiming to be all that there was. I am that I am. He was claiming to be almighty God walking in a physical form in their midst. They didn't like that. But it all came about as a result of them trying not to break this commandment. They wouldn't even pronounce that name of God. Another tradition the Jews had is when they wrote the Scriptures, they would take a pen and they would write the Scripture up until they came to the name of God. And then they would put that pen away, go get another pen that had never been used, a quill. They would dip it in ink, they would write the name of God, and then they would retire that pen forever. And they would go back and get the regular one and continue to write the Scriptures. And they would do that every time they came to the name of God. Over the years, there were thousands of quills put away in honor because they had once written the name of God. And the Jews did all of that lest they break this commandment. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Some of you grew up in homes like this where your parents said, Don't you say G because that's too close to Jesus. And don't say gosh because that's too close to God. And there were probably a list of 12 other ones that you couldn't say. Because they were pretty close. Some of you are smiling because that was your house. And you know what? It's not bad to make a command to keep you from breaking another command. But here's the problem with the Jews is they totally missed the point. They had a tradition, but they didn't keep the heart of this command. And that's what I want to deal with. Because literally, if you look at that verse, put it back up for me, guys. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. What it's literally saying, how we would say that in modern 2008 English is, thou shalt not or don't misuse the name of the Lord your God. Don't misuse His name. Everyone say misuse. So it's possible to misuse the name of God. What it's literally teaching us is don't use the name of God to accomplish something that you want. The name of God is to be used to accomplish what He wants, not to accomplish what you want. Don't misuse the name of God. Don't use the name of God to accomplish something that God has nothing to do with. That's like breaking that commandment would be something like somebody uh, going out and making a business deal in your name, using your bank account, your credit, uh, your money without your knowledge. They, They... Fake that you're, that they're you. They forge your name. And they do business in your name, but you didn't give them authorization. That's the same as this. Don't use God's name to accomplish your will or your means. And when Jesus came to earth, the religious leaders were doing this all the time. 
they, they were always using God's name as a cloak and they, they got what they wanted. They got control over other people and situations by using God's name. And they used God's name to support their loopholes in God's law. They had God's law. They studied it. They knew what it said. And they made everybody else live up to the letter of the law. They were the religious police. They made sure that you and I, if we had lived back then, they made sure that we towed the line on all the little commandments of God. And meanwhile, they were using loopholes so they themselves could get around the law of God. They came up with religious rules just to get around the real meaning of God's commandments. You say, does that really happen? Yeah, human beings have done that for eons. Look at history. Look at church history. The Crusades. When a group of people said, we are going to set Jerusalem free, and they went on uh, expeditions of war to do that, and thousands and thousands and thousands of people were killed. Jerusalem wasn't free when Jesus walked the streets of Jerusalem. That wasn't the main purpose of God for Jerusalem. But somebody made up their mind that the main purpose of the church in the Middle Ages should be to free Jerusalem from the hands of the oppressors. And they used God's name to do that. The Inquisition, many other points in history. The churches in Germany under Adolf Hitler used the name of God to justify what their leader in government was doing. We do that All through history. The angriest Jesus ever got was right here. Luke chapter 19. When he walked into the temple. And people were abusing God's system. They were abusing God's temple. They were abusing God's name. To rip off and take advantage of other people. They were leveraging God's name and God's law for their own ends. And so here it is, Luke 19.45. And he went into the temple and he began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought, saying, It is written, look at this, My house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. What's Jesus saying? He's saying the Eighth Commandment says, Thou shalt not steal, and you're using My name to break the Eighth Commandment. You are stealing from these people. They come to worship, and you charge them triple or quadruple to pay for a sacrifice that didn't cost you anything, and they bring it in, and they offer it, and they're bound by that religious system, and you've created it. You're breaking the Eighth Commandment that says, Thou shalt not steal, and you've made my temple a den of thieves. You're not supposed to rob others, and you've made my temple a place where people are robbed. You've used my name for something I never willed. And then they also broke and bypassed the fifth commandment. The fifth commandment says, honor your father and your mother. Honor your parents. And uh, look at this, Mark 7. This is just so absurd, but Mark chapter 7, verse 9 And Jesus went right at the Pharisees here. He said unto them, Full well you reject the commandment. Everyone say commandment. So you reject the commandment of God, and here's what you replace it with, that you may keep your own tradition. Everyone say tradition. So they took the commandment of God and they ripped it out of place, and in its place they put a tradition. They made a religious tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But you say... If a man shall say to his father or mother, it is korban, that is to say a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And you suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother. Here's what they did in that time. Uh, You were supposed to honor your parents. In fact, in that time, without any kind of social assistance or support, uh, honoring your parents meant that you supported your parents all through their life. And when they got too elderly to look after themselves, it was even more important then, without any kind of social assistance, it was so important that people looked after their family. And the Pharisees would say, Oh, Mom and Dad, I've given all my possessions to God as a gift. Korban. Now, they didn't really give it to God. They didn't go put their house in the offering and sell everything they own and give the money. They they just did a mental declaration. You know, everything I own is God's. And if God ever wants it, He can come down here and tell me. So it's dedicated to God. I gave it as a gift to God. So sorry, Mom and Dad, I can't help you. Sorry, family, can't help you. I've given all this to God. It was a hoax. It was a loophole, and they got around the the heart of the fifth commandment, which said to honor their parents. They got around that commandment by using a loophole. They had taken out the commandment itself. They'd replaced it with 
of tradition. Look at this verse, Mark seven thirteen, Making the Word of God of none effect through your tradition, which you have delivered, and many such like things you do. Je- Jesus said, you do a lot of stuff like this. You know, the quickest way to wreck the power of the Word of God in your life is to replace the true principles of the Word of God with mere religious traditions and lock up the Bible in some traditional religious structure. And and it's just a book that you visit once a week. And God's just a person that you visit once a week. And God is just kind of some idea. And you do it enough so that you think, well, I'm good for heaven. He doesn't really mess with me down here. God doesn't really affect my every day, nine to five life. God doesn't affect that. But once a week I visit God. Once a week I look at the principles of His Word. I hear a religious lecture and it kind of rolls off me like water off a duck's back. That's a tradition, my friend. That doesn't help the Word of God. That binds up the Word of God and keeps it from working in your life. And that is what taking the name of God means. It's using His name to do what you want to to do. People do it all the time in religion. In fact, you probably know this because there's probably people sitting here that sometime in your life you've been hurt by a religious person. You've been hurt by their attitude of judgment toward you. You've been hurt by somebody that made some dumb rule and, and hurt you, wounded you. You've been hurt by somebody that they had the name all right, but Man, the way they acted from uh, day to day through the weeks of their life, it, it hurt you and it wounded you. And you sit here this morning as a witness that people can make rules that have nothing to do with the love and the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness of God. You could give your testimony this morning. It wouldn't be a pretty testimony. It wouldn't even be an inspiring testimony. It would be a testimony of, I love God. But one, one guy stood up one time in a testimony service. He said, thank God I met the Lord before I met His people. It's true. You know, sometimes God's people hurt their own cause because we're not living the, the Word of God or the law of God. We've used the law of God to establish a bunch of traditions. And traditions ruin the power of the Word of God. I'll tell you what, I have enough confidence in this book that if this book gets into somebody's life and somebody's really sincere, I don't have any worries about somebody that's hungry for the Word of God. I don't have any worries about somebody that's just dying to get in the presence of God so they can lift their hands one more time and stand at their feet and let God's presence wash over them. I don't have any worries about people that are hungry for spirit and truth. I don't have any worries about them. I have worries about people that just kind have become accustomed to God over the years and they can sit unmoved in the moving presence of God and it just doesn't affect them. That's tradition. That's religion. Jesus said, that's taking my name in vain. You show up and you mouth my name once a week, but I don't affect you. I'm not your God. You've created a little location for me where it's safe to come once a week. That's not what I want. I want to be front and center, Lord of your life. I don't want you to turn me into a location. And I don't want you to do what you want to do and attach my name to it. I want you to do what I want you to do and attach my name to it. Ever been part of the church police? No, I'm not talking about the ushers. Sometimes I think all of us could say, you know what, I've been guilty of worrying about whether someone conformed more than I was worried about whether God was really transforming them. I got in a rush to see someone conform to everything that we do around here and I wasn't really at my heart concerned about whether God was transforming them. Folks, church, apostolics, if God ever transforms somebody, you won't have to worry about them conforming to the Word of God. They'll do it for the right reason. They'll do it because they love God. And I'd rather wait for someone to do it because they love God than force them to do it because they want to belong. Because that is tradition, just wanting to belong. But it's salvation to let God transform you from the inside out. You don't have to worry about people like that. You'll get the same result, but you'll get it forever. You'll get the same result, but it will be done from the heart. It's infinitely more important to do that. Come on back to the music. 
Now, the real thrust of this commandment, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The real thrust of this commandment is don't establish a religion in my name. Don't do what you want. Because God knew our tendency to turn incredible eternal truths into tedious little earthly nitpicking commands. God knew our tendency as human beings. And so he said, don't take my name in vain. Don't misuse my name. Don't you sign my name to you trying to control somebody else. That's not how I act. Paul said it best. He said, don't be conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this world. See, conforming is the world's process. It squeezes us all into a mold and we all feel pressure to act the same, look the same, go to the same places, uh, know all about the same sports teams and entertainment and movie stars. The world conforms us. And the world says, if you're not this, you don't belong. You're not cool. You're not with it. That's the world's process. And, and woe betide the church that tries to do the work of God with the world's process. This is not about squeezing people into a little mode of conduct. This is about the next part of that verse. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you let the Holy Ghost get inside of somebody, if you let somebody appreciate the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of God, you'll never have to worry about them wanting to do the commandments of God. Never, 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 never. And they do it for the right reason. Don't impose your will on others in my name. Don't violate the clear teachings of the Word of God with your own traditions. You know how easy it is to dodge the law of God in the name of God? Here's a verse we love. Let me just run this one by as we conclude. Just to totally mess up your Sunday. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. One of my favorite verses. I hope it's one of yours. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that a powerful verse? Are you glad that verse is in the Scripture? Because how many know Christians make mistakes? Christians fall flat on their face. Christians sin from time to time. Don't have to. But we do. And I'm so glad that verse is there that if we will confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But, but, have you ever used that verse or verses like it as a loophole to do your will and attach God's name to it? It works like this. Well, God said, if I'll just confess, He'll forgive me. So I'll go ahead and do what my flesh wants to do right now because God's obligated. I've got God over a barrel. God and I have a little thing going. God and I have a contract. And God's obligated to forgive me. So I'll just go do what I want and I'll come back. It's kind of like Pentecostal confession. I'll come back and I'll say, God, oh, forgive me. And then I'll go do it tomorrow and I'll go do it the next day. and I'll go Because God and I have got this little mafia racket going. Where he has to, I've got his arm pulled right up behind his back. Me and the Almighty, I've really got it over on him. I've got a loophole. You see, that's using God's name in an improper way. That's using God's law for something it was never intended to be used for. I get to have my sin and God's forgiveness too. Absolutely not. Forgiveness, listen. Forgiveness is not for perfect people. But forgiveness is for people who genuinely, sincerely, with all of their heart, want to leave sin. Forgiveness is not for people who secretly want to stay in sin and just use God's name and God's word as an excuse so they can stay in sin longer. See, the issue is not the letter of the law. The issue is what's going on in your heart. God never called you to be perfect. He's perfect. God never called you to be without any fault or flaw. He's without fault or flaw. But here's what God did call you to. He called for people that want Him so much and so badly and so sincerely that they don't want sin. Do they fall in sin once in a while? Yes. Do they make mistakes that make them feel horrid? Yes. But do they want to stay there? Absolutely not. That verse is not an escape for you to do what you want 
and put God's name on a P.S. and say, oh, well, God, you've got to forgive me. That verse is for people that with all of their heart say, I once was a slave, but I don't want to act like a slave. I don't want to think like a slave. I don't want to conduct myself like a slave anymore. And when I fall, don't rejoice against me, O oh, mine enemies, because every time I fall, I'm going to arise. I'm going to stand back up. I'm going to ask God for forgiveness, and I'm going to keep going on. But if you think my heart is to hide my sin, if you think my heart is to live like the world and just fake this church thing, you've got another thing coming. I I've got the real deal. God brought me out of slavery. These aren't laws that I fake God out and you out. These are commitments that I've made to God. I will not take God's name in vain. I will not misuse God's name. That's exactly what the third commandment is addressing. Did you notice the warning in this verse? Exodus 20, verse 7, last verse. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. You can't get away from this. You can't avoid the penalty of this person. Here's the penalty. If you get in the habit of dodging the law of God and using the name of God, church attendance, being a Christian, if you use that as a cover, but really in your heart of hearts, you're just keep dodging the law of God. You're hiding Here's the penalty of that. When you dodge the law of God in the name of God, you miss a relationship with God. All you end up with is this. Sitting in a building on Sunday morning with other people that love God, other people that talk about a relationship with God, other people that while you're sitting there unmoved because you're dodging God's law, you, you've got this church thing going, you got it down pat. But other people are standing to their feet, tears rolling down their face, hands raised in surrender to God. And you're thinking like, what is that? Because you've never had that. I challenge you today. Don't dodge the law of God in the name of God. Don't be content with a religion. Religion has done more damage to this planet and the people on it than just about anything else in human history. God knew we have a tendency to establish our will and put His name on it. So He said, don't misuse My name. That's commandment number three. Don't you establish a religion and call it Mine. I want more than a religion. I want a relationship with you. Totally, totally different. Be honest with yourself. You know if you're playing the game with God. You know if you have a weekly religion, but not a daily relationship with God. You know if you're masking your sin with religion. You know if you're dodging the will of God for your life and masking it by using the name of God. Hidden in this command is a plea from God to His people in ancient times. Hidden in this command is a plea from God to His church in modern times. Church, please don't become a religious community. Please don't become a community where you've got all the rules down pat and where you've got the church attendance thing down pat and where you show up at regular intervals but there's no relationship with me. Please don't become a religious community where you can go through a whole Sunday and you can do all your stuff. You can sing. You can do announcements. You can do sermons. You can do little prayers. Please don't become a religious community where you can go through that and if I never show up in my power, you're totally unconcerned. Please, don't become a religion. Become a people of relationship. So that if I'm not there in my power, you'll just keep praying, God, we can't do this without You. We don't want to do this without You. Don't become a religion. Have a relationship. Church member, don't spend your whole life talking about a God and hanging around with God's people and not knowing God for yourself. The only time you ever pray is in this building. You've missed a relationship that God wants to have with you. The only time you ever crack the covers of a Bible is in this building. You've missed the relationship that God wants to have with you. Do you have a personal relationship with God? Really? Really? Or are you just using His name to do your will? 
I guess if we could put anything behind the first three commandments, we'd just say, stop pretending. Put God at the center. Don't try to localize Him to some little religious thing. And for heaven's sake, don't take His name and try to do your thing. Don't take His name and try to come up with some system where you can fake out God's law by using God's name. How ridiculous is that? For every person in here, God is reserved. A relationship with Himself. Not a relationship through a religion. Not a relationship through a pastor. Not a relationship through a group of people that you show up with and worship with once a week. Not that kind of relationship. God has reserved a first person, one-to-one relationship with Himself for you. It's up to you if you take it. Would you stand with Pastor right now in this building? And could I get the folks that know their God? Could I get you to lift up your hands as we conclude this service and just give God praise for His presence that's with us today. The great things that God is doing. Lord Jesus, we worship You today. We honor You today. God, we need more than just a religion. We need more than just another church service. What we need is a Monday through Sunday relationship with You. That's what we need. I worship You, Jesus. I give You praise and honor and glory. God, get down to where we live. Get down to our deepest secret places. God, get down to every corner and every moment of our everyday living. God, change us. Transform us from the inside out. God's calling some of us to prayer. God's calling some of us to His Word. God's calling some of us to do something great for Him. Pastor, pray with you. Let's bow our heads together. Lord Jesus, I thank You, God, for this crowd of people that's gathered in this building this morning. And we don't diminish that, Jesus. This is so important. Your Word tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. So so we do this every week, multiple times. But Lord God, help us to realize today, help someone here that You've zeroed in on by Your Spirit today, help them to realize that this is not the relationship that You talk about in Your Word. This is just one part of that. The relationship is not... A crowd with God. The relationship is one-on-one. You and them. One-on-one in a place of prayer where there's no preacher, no music, no sermon, no church family. Just them. God, would you get a hold of somebody's heart this morning and, and talk to them about that? Because their only relationship with you is through us, through the church, through their church family, through a pastor. They don't really have a relationship one-on-one with you. God, would you get a hold of them today? Would you talk to them? Lord God, I ask you that you'd kind of, just kind of be that nagging voice in the back of their mind this week that says, I'm here. I'm available. I want to talk. I want to be with you. I want to be in your presence and you to be in my presence. God, would you just kind of convict that person this morning. God, somebody else that's kind of just faking everybody out. They've got a religious thing going, but they're dodging your law. They, they keep outward commandments, but the heart of the law, they've messed up so many times. Jesus, would you wrap your arms of love and compassion around them and let them know that you will forgive. But you're not for, you don't love them that way that you would forgive them to see them walk right back into the same sin. You love them enough to want to pull them out of that. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would do your work right now in this congregation of people, but more than that, in the hearts of individuals. In Jesus' name. If you want God to touch you, and if you really want that kind of a relationship with God, would you lift up your hands right now in God's presence? 
You don't have to belong to this church family to do that. You don't have to be a Pentecostal to do that. All you have to have is a heart that really cries out after God. God, I want a real relationship with You. I've got relationships with friends. But Jesus, I don't want that without having a relationship with my Creator. God, I want You to be able to talk to me. I want You to be able to fellowship with me. I want You to be able to walk with me. God, I want those times when it's just You and I and we can talk about everything that's going on in my life. God, I want that so much. I want that so bad. I want that so deep. God, a relationship with You. You are my God. You are my God. And I want You at the center of my life. Not just at the center of my Sunday. I want You at the center of my life. Every decision. Every decision. Every decision. I want You at the center. We just need to kind of cement this. If You would help Pastor right now. Could I get You to just move towards someone and just reach out and take them by the hand? Could You do that with Pastor as we close this service? Just move towards someone. Take them by the hand. And let's pray together. Would You just pray with that person? God, we want a relationship with You. God, we want more than just a religion. God, we want more than just a Sunday service. We want to talk with You in the middle of our trials. We want to talk with You in the middle of our victories. We want to share them with You in the middle of every life situation. We want to be open with You. God, no faking. God, no hiding. God, nothing concealed. Wide open. Hearts open. Minds open. Lives open. God, we want a relationship with You. We want to be Your people. And we declare that You are our God. The real thing, the only thing, the central thing is a relationship with You. God, we want it this morning. We want it this morning. But we want to go forward from this place and from this service and from this day and have that real relationship with You. In Jesus' name we pray it. In Jesus' name we pray it. God, lock it in our hearts. Don't let us walk away from it. saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6.3-6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3.26-27. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings unto the remission of sins, for salvation, to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful.